Hello, everybody. Welcome to Energy News Beat Daily Stand Up. This is the weekly recap. Today is November 2nd. Boy, I mean, we are drawn down to an end of the election season. Holy smokes, I can't wait to find out who won the election. I have a feeling it's President Trump. But hey, with that, like, subscribe, share. The staff has put together the best of the stories that people like. And we got some great feedback this week on our stories. So thanks and uh, sit back and share. And by the way, if it is tax season coming up. If you are paying too much in taxes and you want an investment, we've partnered with Pecos Operating and they are drilling oil left and right. And they offer a very good incentive for folks uh, to invest and they we're uh, averaging about 30%, uh, 32% on our money back. So if you want information, just give us a shout out. We'll be glad to uh, send that information your way. Thanks and have an absolutely wonderful day. Talk to you all soon. Biden's eat mandate backfires as customers rebel against electric cars. This is absolutely customers' interest in traditional internal combustion en engines is rebounding due to the affordability concerns about $75,000 plug-in vehicles. Nobody can afford a $75,000 Tesla. No, nobody can. Uh, some 67% of co consumers say they prefer an internal combustion engine for their next vehicle up from 58%, Michael. That's that's a lot of people saying, hey, I'm done. I got to have me a regular internal combustion. Yeah, it's, I mean, who's going to go out and spend that type of money on a car that doesn't perform as well as a combustion vehicle? That is the whole point. I would be all for EVs if not only could you, if if they actually perform to the standards at which your natural combustion engine would be. I mean, I was out at the oil field all weekend. Right. Trust me, guys, you can't have an EV out there. It's really tough. About the one thing that'll last out there is a cyber truck, but still that, you know, we won't get into that later again. And, and, and again, where's all this electricity coming from? Ask yourself that question. Just because you plug it into a wall doesn't mean that that electricity yep. that's flowing through the wall was generated by, what you would consider in on, on the lean energy, because, you know, maybe it came from a coal fired plant. Right. I remember watching there's that uh, famous Michael Moore documentary where they go talk to the they were opening up a new electric vehicle charging station at some uh, I forget what city it is. And they they quiz the, uh, you know, the, the the guy who was in charge of building it or like the, the county electrician. He was like, oh, yeah, all this 98 percent of the electricity that's flowing here is actually generated from the local coal plant. It's like, oh, OK, it's just you're 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 putting yeah. yourselves you know, seven steps away from the source. So you can, it's like a blood diamond. Oh, you don't know where they came from. We didn't know they were using child labor to get all this stuff. So it really, you know, the farther you can remove yourself from the source, the the more quote unquote comfort you feel like you can take. It's pretty unbelievable. And it, what I, what I find funny is that the base scenario that the EPA has for 2032 is that by then 56% of all models must be non hybrid EVs. I mean, I'm all for hybrids. I think hybrids, if you want to be clear, are probably going to end up being the future of cars because there's, right. there's nothing wrong with batteries. We love, we, I love a good battery. If you can, if you can tell me I can increase my efficiency by mixing two technologies, I'm all for that. So I mean, it's pretty unbelievable. But there's a mistake that the Biden Harris team did. And that is they messed with a tax break saying you get a tax break, but here's the formula that you had to use for that tax break. Only 20% of the cars qualified for the tax break. It was absolutely worthless. This one is one line in here, yet 190, 190 Democrats in the House recently voted in mass against amendments to ease the unachievable EV mandates. They are still sitting there, Michael, going, hey, wait a minute. Oh, we want these EV mandates. Well, I think, it's also I think really people easy are going to vote. I think it's also people easy to vote, vote on policies out. that are five or 10 years out in the future because most people are like, well, I won't be in office then. We'll let that Congress deal with the fallout and I can vote to show my constituents that, look, I'm on the quote unquote right side of the argument. So I think a lot of this is show me here and then in 10 years we'll figure it. It's like the debt ceiling. Everybody cries about the debt on both sides of the aisle. 
And then when it comes down to it, they just raise the limit. Don't get me started. Investors turn to fossil fuels as green energy falters on cost and reliability. Yep. I thought this was an excellent article from Issues and Insights. And uh, let's go through a couple of the points in here. Despite vast green stimulus packages in the U.S., Europe, and China, more hedge funds are average net short batteries, solar, electric vehicles, and hydrogen than are those that are in more funds are net long fossil fuels and are shorting oil and gas and coal. Bloomberg reports that hedge funds and institutions have concluded that many climate investments haven't yet posted returns quickly or profitably as they expected. So people are tired of it. They want their money back and they're putting their money into fossil fuels, dude. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's also smart to point out that most hedge funds perform basically in on par with the S&P 500. So I don't necessarily look to hedge funds as a source of truth in terms of, oh, this is exactly what's going to happen. But what it does is it shows a consensus among people who look at this stuff a lot harder than me and you on in right. over the long run, where are the gains to be had and where are there opportunities right. to make money on the downside? So I'm not shocked by this you know obviously this is a shift from where it was four or five years ago because there was all of this money dumping in and what i find surprising is that even with all of the direct money being pumped in via the the inflation reduction act and all of these different green stimulus packages that you're not seeing better underlying performance from these companies what that shows you is you know it, it doesn't matter how much capital you spend what matters is, right. are you going to make a return? We're about to talk about that when we come to finances. I mean, it's a energy is a capital intensive business, no matter what side of the equation you're on, and it it, right. it forces you to think a little bit differently about kind of the, the underlying stuff. Um, I love this quote from Bloomberg, and I'll just read straight from the article here. Bloomberg report that hedge funds institutions have concluded that, quote, many climate investments haven't posted returns as quickly or as profitably as they expected. Now, I could have told you that. I could You could have given me half the money they're paying these hedge fund guys, and I could have told you the exact same thing. Right. Many roadblocks delay journey to zero carbon world. Who would have thought? Trillions of dollars need to get spent, and there's some, all of a sudden, there's roadblocks in between? Yeah, absolutely. Here we go. Reading straight from the article here, our friends over at Reuters, the task of decarbonizing the global economy can be split into three parts. Electrify as many activities as possible, but remember, it doesn't, where's the electrification matters. Next, use low-carbon processes when it's not, uh, when that's not possible, and make electricity in ways that do not spew out greenhouse gases see again the goalposts are always shifting they're always shifting it used to be electrify everything now it's wow well, if we can't do it let's use low carbon and let's make sure that we're not spewing i mean the, the goalposts are constantly moving you know they point out that quote the good news is this is happening the bad news though is that it's not happening nearly fast enough and what's funny is you got the iea who again if the iea and goldman sachs agree on something I take that stuff seriously. Just like if the IEA and OPEC agree on something, you know, I'm not, I'm not the biggest Goldman Sachs guy per se, but they're generally fairly, I guess, straight up and down with this stuff. They don't really care one way or the The IEA does care. They want to go completely green. But they agree here. They've got three charts here. The global power mix. Can we go ahead and throw that chart up here? The global power mix. I mean, look, here's what it is in 2023. That's the orange. 2040 is what it needs to be. And then in 2060, that's the blue. Okay, so look at how coal's going to ramp down. If you're listening, coal ramps down from 2023 to 2040 to 2060. Gas ramps down. Nuclear stays the same. That's interesting. And renewables drastically increase. And if you actually think we're going to achieve that, it's pretty unbelievable. The funny part is, is that according to Peter Hill, okay, the problem is that the demand, the, 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 the issue with all of this is that the fossil fuel demand is, is delaying this eventual switch. Well, of course, because, you know, and, and he said this in Glasgow at the United Nations back in 2021. I mean, this isn't something new here, folks. You also have to remember the IEA central, you know, net zero 
scenario that they're working with, which is based on government-stated policies, have demand for all three major fossil fuels reaching a peak and then falling by 2030. Goldman's main scenario, which is quote-unquote more ambitious, foresees consumption continuing to grow up until 2030 while consumers keep burning more gas until the 2040s, which, again, is what's going to happen. We're not going to just take, we're not just going to get off natural gas. It's un unbelievable. What's hilarious is Goldman Central's scenario three years ago. So if look back three years ago, it's what Goldman said. They think that coal would account for only 23% of the elect the electricity production by 2030. It now expects it to be 28. So we're revising upward. Here's another thing that's interesting. Three years ago, Goldman and I uh, said that a CCUS Carbon sequestration and underground storage would capture 140 million tons of carbon dioxide in 2030. As we stand today, it's barely a tenth of that. So they're really great at doing projections. So maybe I'm not sure if we should be happy whether or not they think it's one way or the other. And it, it's irrational to think that we're going to be able to completely rip off as quickly as they want. And again, coming back to all of this. It's all about politics. It's not really about the climate because if it was about the climate, you would understand that one, the United States produces the most energy efficient and the most emissions reducing natural gas in the world. So if it was all about just emissions and the and and the and the intersection between emissions and efficiency, everybody would be all natural gas. But that's not politically correct because that would then mean their friends in the environmental business who are trying to build wind farms and solar farms wouldn't get money and they wouldn't have any people to vote for. And again, it all comes down to politics, folks. Okay. There's also the whole green hydrogen scam which is going on right now, which we don't really have time to get into. I'm already too worked up about this and the and the other article we talked about. So just it's just another example, folks. These these projections are just that. They're projections. Whether or not they come true, we will find out. BP and Shell brace for profit drops. Kind of top headlines here. BP and Shell are expected to report lower profits this week due to weak oil prices and falling refining margins. Remember, a lot of these companies make their money on the, or these integrated oil and gas companies make their money on the refining side, not necessarily on the upstream side. Both companies are facing massive investment pressure. Uh, BP has already come out and said they're scaling back their energy plans and Shell's CEO has hinted at a potential New York Stock Exchange listing, which is interesting. Um, we've also seen activist investors like Bluebell Capital Partners come out and openly criticize BP's management, calling for the resignation of their chairman. It's it's pretty crazy. We will see BP, BP's due to publish their earnings on Tuesday, while Shell will be on Thursday. You know, they've already signaled, hey, we're going to have a massive slump. But again, going back to the fact that most of these companies make their money on the refining sector side. So, you know, we'll continue to to monitor that. Again, going back to the fact that a CEO of Shell did come out and say that we're going to probably end up on the New York Stock Exchange. And why would you not? Why? If you're an oil and gas company, why would you end up on the London Stock Exchange? Expose yourself to windfall profit taxes. Expose yourself to just all of the capital pressure and investor pressure that happens when you're in UK. I'd get out. I'd get to New York as fast as you can. Um, BP shares, going back to them, are down 14 percentage points this year. And, you know, we already know that their new CEO, Murray A A Achinkloss, is basically scaling back their renewables business and propping up their oil and gas business. Reuters has also reported that Achinkloss has taken plans, and I'm reading that straight from the article, has taken his plans a step further by abandoning a target cut, which we have covered, um, to cut oil and gas by 40% by 2030. Pretty unbelievable. But of course, I would get out of the business too. Why would you not? Let's go to the Colonial Pipeline. Colonial Pipeline weighs sale at $10 billion plus the value. Holy smokes. The Alpharetta, the Georgia-based company, is working with advisors to see if it gauges interest from potential buyers, according to the people who asked not to be identified, as it could draw interest from financial institutions as infrastructure funds, as well as that. Colonial Pipeline operates the most vital fuel systems in the U.S., covering more than 5,500 miles from Houston to New Jersey. Boy, I don't know if you remember when the Colonial uh, Pipeline had a uh, cyber attack hit it and it caused some real heartburn. 
I'll tell you what, you shut down diesel and you shut down uh, gasoline, you're going to have some serious problems. And then building a replacement for this is just not going to happen. Pipelines are a fantastic investment. Reuters uh, report reported in June that some of the Colonial Pipeline owner were exploring, exploring divesting their stakes. Deliberations are an early stage. There's no certainty that Colonial Pipeline will decide to pursue a sale. There, there's some conspiracy theories that are already swir swirling around this. Now, remember, there are big things. Even the Twin Towers uh, sold right before they went down. So you can imagine some of the conspiracy theories that people are saying, wait a minute, if this is going to get sold, is it going to get uh, shut down or permanently harmed? I don't think so, but you never know. During the summer, One Oak agreed to buy Global Infrastructure Partners entire interest in in-link mainstream and equity interest in medallion uh, the largest closely crude hell gathering transportation system in the permian basin pipelines are a fantastic investment so uh whoever's looking at this i think it's a good buy because gas and gasoline and uh, diesel are not going away anytime soon ford lost another 58k for every ev sold in in the third quarter or 1.2 billion dollars you can't buy this kind of entertainment the the 1.2 billion q3 loss brings its 2024 hit to 3.7 billion dollar loss holy smokes demand struggles high cost and charging issues still dodging the ev push i think that tesla and elon are going to be the last man standing in the ev market in the u.s we need to go to i'll tell you what we have got to go instead of like thelma and louise off a cliff we need to go to the first one that comes out with a good truck a hybrid model will be the winner in the ev market i guarantee you because i consider hybrids pretty close to evs and i think that that's going to be a big difference the 3.7 billion dollar loss is equal to the gross profit ford calls it ebit short for earnings before interest and taxes it made on ford blue the division that makes internal combustion cars so internal but combustion cars Everything was wiped out by the EV side. Holy smokes, Batman. I do want a Cybertruck. I just want to go on record because uh, I think we everybody needs a bulletproof car. So take a Ford three, uh, 350 internal combustion and make it bulletproof or buy a Cybertruck. I don't know. I think I'm going to buy a Ford 250 and then buy a Cybertruck and be at the same price point. That way I got two vehicles. I feel good for helping the environment.